Uh, my name is Eitan Margaret Epstein, uh, and today I'm going to give a tutorial on navigation. Uh, first, I'm going to start with a brief overview of navigation, and then we're going to complete these three tasks uh, together. And so the first task is, is we're going to run navigation with SLAM, and we're actually going to build a map of this tent. And so we're going to do that by a combination of sending goals to the robot through uh, our visualization tool, Arviz, which you guys have played with, and also by just joysticking the robot around. So after we've done that, uh, we're going to learn how to send goals to the navigation stack through code. So this will be important to you if you ever want the robot to go somewhere uh, programmatically. And then after that, we're going to save the map that we built and use it for navigation later. Because the first thing you might do in your lab is drive the robot around, build a, lab, a map, and then save it and, and want to reuse it. So I'll walk you through all of that. So what's the point? We want the robot to get from point A to B in an office environment uh, over and over again in a robust and reliable manner. A typical office environment might look something like this. So basically, you, you have to avoid all sorts of different obstacles. Uh, you have to avoid obstacles like tables, chairs, people, uh, obstacles occluded by others. I put like a little coffee cup behind a desk to kind of show, like, in my opinion, one worst case scenario. Uh, and, and obstacles of all sorts of different shapes and sizes. So you might have to avoid staplers and stuff like that. So, and we want to do this on the PR2 robot, which uh, you're well aware of its capabilities, but it's got a holonomic, well, pseudo holonomic base. Uh, it's got a planar Hakuyo laser, which we use for making maps and, and also for obstacle avoidance. And it's also got an actuated Hakuyo uh, that we tilt at about a two-second period. So it takes two seconds to, to take a full 3D scan of the environment. So there is a lot of latency associated with that sensor. So our approach to, to obstacle avoidance and kind of the core of our navigation system is to create this 3D voxel grid uh, to store information about free, uh, or occupied and, and also unknown space. Um, and so what this allows us to do is we can actually reason about areas that we haven't seen. So we could avoid something like that coffee cup behind the desk because we're tracking unknown space explicitly. It also allows the robot to do things like slow down around a corner naturally because it knows that it hasn't seen that space around the corner and it won't go into to unknown space. Um, so just kind of briefly, what we do is we, we take sensor data in, we build this 3D voxel grid, and then for planning, we actually project it down to two dimensions. But it's important to note that we're always doing our updates in 3D. So the ray tracing that we do is all in 3D. Um, so we do have this 3D view of the world, and once planning techniques kind of catch up, I guess, they could use that 3D information uh, to be smarter. But right now, for efficiency reasons, we still project it down into two dimensions to plan. Um, and so, yeah, this implementation is kind of nifty. I'll just gloss over it a little bit. Uh, we can actually get 3D ray tracing at 2D speed because we store this uh, two-dimensional array of 32-bit integers where each two bits of an integer represents a cell in a vertical column. So we have two bits, so we can represent uh, known occupied, known free, and, and unknown space. Uh, and we have one more bit that we're not actually using. We should probably find a use for that some point. Um, but what this means is we can, uh, we can ray trace in 2D just using like standard Bresent hams, but then uh, in 3D we can ray trace in the, in the vertical or in the Z dimension, I guess, by doing these very fast bitwise and and or operations. So it's just a very, very fast uh, 3D grid. Uh, this does mean you're limited to 16 columns uh, vertically in your grid, so that's important to remember. If you have a 64-bit machine, which actually these robots do, uh, you can get 32 uh, columns. So, right. So before we take the sensor into the grid, uh, we pass it through a sensor processing pipeline, which I'm also just going to talk about briefly. So we need to do things like filter out uh, shadow points. So when a laser hits a surface at a high incidence angle, you may actually get false positives. Um, so we filter those out. Also, you may get hit points on the robot's body, so we filter those out. And we also want to filter the, uh, the ground plane um, out of our sensor data, but also still recognize small obstacles, like the book in front of the robot uh, on the screen right here. And I think what you'll notice today is that this floor is not flat. So you may see some interesting false positives in our ground plane detection. We're working to improve that in Sea Turtle. We're hoping to have an improvement for it, but we're running Box Turtle code, unfortunately. So 
do expect to see some false positives on the ground, I guess, when you're running today. Um, for our global planner, we just use a grid-based planner that uses an A-star heuristic. And it's important to know that it's, it's optimistic. So it's using the inscribed circle of the robot to plan. So there, there are actually cases where the global planner can tell the robot to do something infeasible um, because it is planning with just a circle. Uh, so we also have this local planner that takes the global plan and tries to follow it, uh, taking into account the dynamics of the robot. So it just uses the dynamic window approach, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Uh, and it checks collisions uh, using the full footprint of the robot. So the gist of it is it rolls out a number of possible trajectories and just picks the one that scores the best based on some cost function and also a collision-free path. All of this kind of comes together in the navigation stack. Uh, and I really hate talking through system diagrams, so I, I'll just put this up briefly. But um, you can see that there are a whole bunch of nodes that correspond to different things. So we've got these two cost maps. If you see the global cost map and the local cost map, which are these voxel grids that I was talking about before. So they build up our 3D environment, and we can do obstacle avoidance in them. Then we have our global and local planner. And all of those are integrated into one ROS node. So we want communication between those components to be efficient, so we put them inside of a node. Um, another thing to note is that both the global and local planner are plugins. So if you were so inclined, you could replace one of them with your own implementation without replacing the rest of the navigation stack. So I guess this is just kind of an example of how ROS gives you a lot of flexibility, because you can swap out any of these components for something you write without losing uh, the rest of the work that we've done for navigation. So the hope is that if you see something today where you say, man, like, you know, Eitan, your local planner sucks, I'll be like, OK, that's great. But uh, you can write your own, and we can compare them. And I'd, I'd love to take yours if it's better than mine. But we don't lose the rest of the work that I've done. So, okay, so now uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the flavors of navigation that ship with the PR2. Uh, so navigation has one kind of core set of configuration files, but, but we run, the, we run uh, in slightly different um, manners. So the first is we ship with an application that allows you to do navigation in, in the odometric frame. So this means you don't have any map. Uh, you actually get drift from your odometry. But it's really good for doing stuff like, say, moving 10 feet in front of you given you detected uh, an object. We use that a lot. Uh, another flavor is slam-based navigation. So this is where you start up in an unknown environment, and you're building a map as you go along. Uh, and that's actually the first uh, application I guess we're going to run today. And then the third is you provide a map, and that map is just known as, as ground truth. And then you run like AMCL, uh, Adaptive Monte Carlo Localization, in that map to register your position. And, and navigate that way. So, so that third, uh, I guess, application flavor is how we run the robot around Willow Garage a lot when we wanted to go from office to office to office. We have labels for everyone's offices and, and that kind of stuff. So we have this first task, which is to make a map. And before I have you guys do that, I'm just going to kind of show an example of what's going on. So here in Arvis, there's a special, oh, awesome. There's a special uh, launch file that uh, will be pointed to you in the, in the tutorial you're about to do, which brings up Arvis in like a navigation, I guess, friendly configuration. And so what you can see is uh, you can see the robot and kind of obstacles in front of it. And this is, I guess, kind of boring right now. So. Um, so you can see me move in front of it, and you can see the latency associated with the tilt laser. But what you also see is it, it can get my feet. But, but you notice how long it took me to clear out, right? So that's something to remember as well. Like, if your robot is surrounded by people right now, uh, we don't have uh, an awesome solution to, to clear things out very quickly. Um, the one thing we've, we've tried to guarantee is that the robot's really, really safe. So it'll rarely hit things, but sometimes it will uh, appear stuck for a little bit, and it can take some time to clear the obstacles out of the map. Um, and then, then, so the other thing I can do is uh, I can use Arvis to say send a goal to the navigation stack. So I can tell it to move just a little bit forward and it'll go where I tell it to. So you kind of get the idea. And also you can see that this is constructing a map, so it's kind of growing at the, at the back end of the screen. 